So we'll get started. Um, welcome to this uh, UK Catalysis Hub webinar. It's my very great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Ian Silverwood, who is an instrument scientist at the ISIS uh, Neutron and Muon Source. Um, he was once a, a hub postdoc um, and is now leading um, on the uh, Quen's bag. Um, so I will hand over to Ian. Thanks, Josie. Hi, everyone. I won't hang around. I'll just get straight into my slides. Hopefully you can see them. And away we go. OK, so as Josie said, I'm Ian. Uh, I work at the ISIS Neutron and Muon Source, which is based at the Harwell campus. Uh, here we have a lovely picture of it. And this is where the Harwell campus is, if you didn't know. Uh, here we have another view of the whole campus, so the research complex where the catalysis hub is, diamond light source, and then ISIS here in the foreground. We have two target stations, one target station here and another target station here. Could you see my pointer when I was doing that? Yes, no, uh, anyone? Yes, there's a little yellow uh, pointer. Good. Right, so... This is how ISIS works. We have a uh, linear accelerator, which accelerates hydrogen ions, inject them into a synchrotron for further acceleration, goes through a stripping foil to make protons. Protons are accelerated up to 86% of the speed of light, I think it is, and then fired down into target station one or target station two. So the synchrotron gives out a pulse at 50 hertz, four pulses go to TS1, and then the fifth pulse goes to target station two. When then the target is tungsten, the main body of it is tungsten, and that uh, spallation occurs, which means that uh, when you hit it with a proton, more protons come out. It's around 18 or 19 protons out, sorry, 18 to 19 neutrons out to each proton in. Uh, we also make muons, but that's not the subject of this talk. So IRIS, I'm the responsible instrument scientist for IRIS, which is located here within the instrument hall on target station one. So this is just a quick overview of what IRIS looks like. We have neutrons coming in through an instant beam monitor. They scatter off the sample. Uh, to a monochromating analyzer bank, which then get reflected back into our detectors, which is shown here in red. So why would you want to do quens? So in quens, what we do is we probe the motion of predominantly hydrogen at a molecular level uh, on the scales of sort of picoseconds and angstroms which if you then do the maths comes out to more traditional diffusion coefficients at around 10 to the minus eight meters squares per second. Um, because these are essentially molecular timescales, we don't see a uh, particle size effect, which you would see in more uh, in measurement of larger uh, diffusion or lengths by other techniques such as chromatography. Um, because we're also looking on these scales, we can see things which can find in type pores, for example. Now, the mass behind all this is very well known and is relatively trivial if you've got a computer. Um, it allows a good um, inter interaction with modeling techniques uh, and neutron observables can be directly extracted or calculated from trajectories in molecular dynamics. Uh, it complements other techniques such as bulk measurement of diffusion and PFG NMR, but it also has a unique contrast that neutrons provide that other probes don't. 
Okay, so things you can do with it. Practically in chemistry, we mostly look, or within catalysis, we mostly look at uh, diffusion within zeolites, but it is possible to look at um, other systems, solid oxide fuel cells, clays, and so on. We can also look at proteins, so biocatalysis is possible. And you can do physics-y things, and then as I've already mentioned, modeling is good to support your measurements. So now I'll just go on to telling you a bit about neutrons. Uh, so the structure of the talk is basically a bit about neutrons, then a bit about quens, and then some practicalities of the measurements themselves. So the very basic neutron things are that you have a neutral charge, uh, which means that it is a very weak interaction with matter. So X-rays, uh, photons, electrons, other things, um, they interact with the electron cloud, whereas neutrons don't, they interact with the nuclei. Um, it weighs one atomic mass unit, near enough, and it carries its energy as momentum. So a faster moving proton, sorry, faster moving neutron has a higher kinetic energy uh, than a slow moving one. Um, we also have to think of them in terms of quantum particle wave duality. Uh, faster neutrons have shorter wavelengths and so on. Uh, yeah, as I said, they interact with the nuclei, which effectively means that they are point, or the atoms they scatter from are point scatterers because the wavelength of the neutron is much larger than the size of the atomic nucleus. Although they are neutral things, they will decay outside the nucleus, but they are long lived enough that you can catch them in a bottle and keep them around for a bit. And also they have a magnetic moment, but uh, again, this is beyond the scope of this talk. So just to show a bit more the difference between X-rays and neutrons, um, on the left-hand side, we have uh, a, a rose inside a lead casket. And you can see that with neutrons, you can see the rose pretty well. Uh, this is because neutrons are very sensitive to hydrogen. Um, and we'll get into that a bit more. Over on the right, you can see an X-ray on top of the camera and the neutron imaging below it. Um, the thing to note is that the X-rays predominantly show the metal in the camera, whereas the neutrons predominantly show the plastic in it because of the hydrogen within the plastic. So over on the left hand side here in the X, oops, on the left hand side here, there is a plastic film spool, which is pretty much invisible with the X-rays that stands out well in the neutron. And you can see the body, the plastic body also a lot clearer. Okay. So when neutrons come into a come in, uh, fired at a target, they can essentially do three things. They can be transmitted, which is boring. They can be absorbed, which is something that we're not interested in, but you should be aware of. Um, they create an excited state of the nucleus, which is then likely to decay. And the thing that we're most interested in is scattering. So a neutron interacting with a sample can be scattered off in uh, a direction with a speed, a transfer of speed and a change in direction. So what we measure is what we call the double differential cross section, which is the number of neutrons that will or the ratio of the number of neutrons that we put in to the number of neutrons that come out in a certain solid angle and within a certain time range. Uh, and that is what we measure. Now, 
what we want is we want to reduce our data as it's called to something which is not a property of them the sample and the instrument but down to an absolute function uh, and so what we want to get is the scattering function which is the probability of essentially the probability of finding an atom uh, sorry probability of a neutron being scattered into into the detector of a given area within a different uh, within a certain time um, now for our purposes the scattering function s is a function of q which is uh, the momentum energy tra transfer vector uh, and it is a vector and e which is our energy transfer but energy transfer is a scalar so what we need to remember is q is a change in momentum and e is a change in energy uh, so they are indirectly linked but they're definitely not the same um, and we can also it is also commonly written as omega which is the frequency of the neutron so this scattering function can be subdivided into a number of ways but the most important one is incoherent and coherent scattering so it's quite mathsy to do it formally but if you wave your hands around you can come up with a scheme like this so incoherent scattering can be thought of as a particle like scattering where a neutron goes in hits a, at, a, hits a hydrogen atom and then comes off um, just like billiard balls and in that case the information you get is from individual scatterers uh, so an individual atom doing this thing or sometimes it's also described as diffuse scattering with coherent scattering you get something which is more wave-like uh, in that you get interference from uh, the neutron wave interacting with the entire crystal framework if it is a crystal framework or if it's a shorter range interaction you still get this coherent scattering um, if you do the maths in the full quantum way it all works out um, now how strongly these scatter depend on the uh, the nucleon not the nucleon, the nucleus, sorry, of the atom. And uh, they get described as cross sections, uh, which determine how strongly or how likely the neutron is to be scattered, either coherently or incoherently, um, across the periodic table. The, the strength of this scattering cross sections um, very apparently randomly as it is often described which either means that physicists don't understand it or that it's too complicated for chemists to be told about um yeah so of considerable interest there is hydrogen you can see that hydrogen has the biggest incoherent cross section or the biggest practical incoherent cross section because gadolinium absorbs very very strongly um, so if we're looking at a mixed system with hydrogen present, most of our incoherent scattering is going to be coming from hydrogen. Now, I mentioned it's um, dependent on the, the atom itself, but it is also dependent on the, uh, the isotope. So in hydrogen, one, we have a massive incoherent cross-section. In deuterium, it's reversed. So we have a larger coherent cross-section than incoherent. Now, this means that if you're doing a diffraction experiment or something where you're trying to look at long-range order, uh, it is better to deuterate the sample. In friends, where you're looking at stochastic diffusion of individual particles, Hydrogen is the thing you need. And I've put tritium up there as well, just to show that it does vary 
uh, across all isotopes of the material. Okay, so that's neutrons interaction with matter and basic properties of neutrons. So now we'll start talking about quens, quasi-elastic neutron scattering. So we want to look at the energy change uh, in our neutrons. So we fire neutrons um, into our sample and we measure the energy change after they've interacted. Um, so an elastic peak is essentially uh, a delta function. Um, and then, so red for stop, green for go. As you start seeing motion, the, the peak will broaden um, into uh, an inelastic component or you can get both components within the same system. Delta peak essentially is static and anything broader than that is inelastic or quasi-elastic. Uh, we are looking at very, very low energies, as I said. So we're looking on iris on a range of about one micro EV, which is about 0 0.008 wave numbers. So this corresponds not to vibrational motions, but essentially stochastic tracer diffusion um, within our system where the uh, energy levels are so close that they're effectively non-quantized and we can treat it as a, a sort of a continuous fluid system as long as it's moving. Uh, yeah, so that basically says the same thing, but where we have mobile atoms, the neutron energy um, is affected by Doppler shifting. They scatter off the moving atoms, and we get the information about how they're moving from the energy transfer that we observe. So in terms of our experimental limits, um, we have a limitation on all instruments of the resolution and the dynamic range. So if we go back here, we can see the elastic line is infinitely thin, uh, which of course uh, with an instrument gets broadened out to a resolution function. So the slowest thing we can see um, is basically the resolution function of the instrument. And a peak that is narrower than the resolution, as far as we're concerned, cannot be measured um, as a moving entity. It is static on the time scale of the instrument. Similarly, if the peak gets broader and broader and broader, eventually it will flatten out and we will not be able to distinguish that from a flat line. So we have for each instrument a, or for each instrument setting, we have a dynamic window in which we can see what is moving. Uh, and we also have an associated Q range, uh, which would tell us about the, uh, the length scales that we can see at. This is an example of some data um, so over on the left, we have um, the a stack of the peaks, as I've just shown, the energy at different values of Q. So again, Q is momentum transfer, omega is energy transfer. Um, so if you have something which is scattered through a shallow angle compared to a uh, high angle, they can have the same energy, the protons are moving at the same speed, but different momentum transfers because the direction of travel has changed significantly. Um, now, with most WENs, we are looking at powdered samples, so we only get to look at Q in one dimension. So like the difference between a uh, 
single crystal crystallography and uh, powder diffraction. Uh, because we are using a powder, it, it, it only gives us information in one dimension. So here, what we can see on the left, essentially, is our Bragg peaks at zero energy transfer in this material. And then here, we can see a motion uh, where it is Q-dependent. There aren't sharp peaks in this system. Uh, but you can see, hopefully, that it's less intense and narrower at high Q and more intense and sharper, sorry, more intense at low Q and narrower. So broader down here, but it doesn't look like that because the intensity is low. And sharper here with high intensity. OK. So the energy change tells us about the rate of motion, uh, which we can see from well, what I've described about Doppler scattering. And then I've talked about how Q dependence, basically the angle or partially determined by the angle through which the neutron is scattered, it's along with the energy, uh, gives us the geometry of motion. Um, so like with elastic scattering, you can get your drag scattering. Here we are also looking at the inelastic scattering, which can tell us about the geometry of motion rather than the geometry of static things. Uh, Q is also referred to as inverse space, which hopefully you all know about. If not, ask me at the end and I'll explain it to you. Um, so we have our Q dependence in inverse space. We can then Fourier transform that to get real space. Uh, the energy change is giving you, well, the energy change, which I've said is uh, carried as momentum within the particle. Um, so, yes. The energy change, which is carried by speed within the particle, because energy is a scalar and speed is a scalar. Um, we know the energy of it, which gives us the rate. We know the Q dependence, which gives us the geometry. And if we know how fast something is going and the distance it goes, we understand fusion. And if you understand that, then you understand quens from a conceptual basis. Now, it gets a bit more tricky as we move into data analysis, a more sort of formal, rigorous um, description of what is going on. So possibly the simplest measurement that we generally make is what we call an elastic fixed window scan. So if you integrate all of the intensity under the or with it in the resolution of the instrument. Um, at absolute zero, all of your scattering will be elastic because there's no motion. As you heat things up, the elastic intensity will drop, assuming that motion continues to increase. Um, and so the peak intensity will uh, it'll broaden out and get lower. So the peak maximum will drop. And the peak area will stay roughly the same and get broader. Assuming that everything goes as you might expect. Now, over on the right, we have a, an example of where this wouldn't go as expected, uh, which is from this paper by Alex Hawkins and David Lennon, uh, where we see the elastic scattering going down until a certain temperature. Uh, this is propene in ZSM5. So it gets faster and faster and faster as you heat up. But then around 250 for curve A and around 300 for curve B, you start to get an increase. And this puzzled us to start with uh, before we worked out that what was happening was that the mobile propene 
inside the ZSM5 pore was reacting and polymerizing. So the propene, small molecule, easy to move around, as it then reacts with the acid sites within the ZSM5 to form a polymer, that then restricts the motion of the hydrogen more. And we can see how the steamed catalyst changes or varies from the fresh catalyst and how that affects the acidity and the reaction that it undergoes. So we can do that fairly easily to see how dynamics uh, sort of enter the window, enter the dynamic window of the instrument or leave the dynamic window of the instrument. If we want to be more clever and get as much information out as possible, we need to fit our peaks to a theoretical model. So this is an example of a quens measurement where we have the uh, cyan trace as the experimental data. We have measured the resolution of the instrument, which is shown in black. Uh, we have quasi-elastic Lorentzian peak, um, pretty much always the broadening is Lorentzian, but it's not universal. And then we have a background. So the background in this case is because, as I've said, the dynamics are so far out of range, the peak has broadened to be indistinguishable from a flat background. So we have a fast motion that we can see but can't characterize. And then we have this Lorentzian peak that we can measure and the elastic peak, um, which is the resolution function. So what we have when we try to fit these peaks is we have a convolution uh, of the individual components with the resolution of the instrument. So the elastic peak appears as a convolution of a delta function and the resolution function, which is generally experimentally measured. And then the Lorentzian, as shown, would then be uh, convoluted with everything else. And that leads to uh, basically the fit which we see between, well, the fit is not hugely well shown there because I haven't got the raw data in it. Uh, but you can appreciate hopefully how that cyan trace, which has been fitted with these individual components, uh, how the individual components uh, combine to fitting our peak. So as I said, the broadening that we get is generally fitted by Lorentzian uh, and there is the formula for Lorentzian. So gamma is the half width of half max of the peak. And we want to measure that through our fitting. There can be more than one Lorentzian, as I've said there. We can only see one. The second is a background because it's too fast, but you can have more than one Lorentzian peaks, more than one Lorentzian peak within the uh, time and distance scale of the instrument. And we want to see how those vary with our Q, uh, which is our momentum transfer uh, as measured in inverse space. So the simplest model uh, is what is called normal diffusion or Fickian diffusion, uh, which is uh, free isotopic diffusion. Basically, the particle can go wherever it wants. Uh, you can think of it as, as Brownian motion. It's continuously moving and it can access any point in space. Now, if you do the maths on the Stokes Einstein equation, what you get out is you get a linear uh, fitting or where the full width half max which is uh, twice gamma, which is the half with half max, um, gives a straight line with Q squared. And the relationship is quite nice and simple. It's dQ squared or dsQ squared, 
where ds is the self-diffusion coefficient. So our self-diffusion coefficient is diffusion when there is no concentration gradient within the sample. So essentially it is, um, is what I said, it's in dynamic equilibrium. Now, normal diffusion or Fickian diffusion is, um, it's basically more of a bulk type measurement. Um, so it works on the macroscopic scale. If we look into the microscopic scale, as we do with Quenz, we can often see different, uh, different behavior. So these are different theoretical models for diffusion. Uh, the long range diffusion models are uh, shown. So basically everything that isn't confined is a long range diffusional model. And you can see that as you go to lower Q, they all approximate Fickian diffusion. They're all linear within a restricted Q range. As they get to higher Q, uh, sorry, confined motion has constant gamma. So the peak width um, for confined motion is Q invariant. Uh, the intensity can change, but the peak width doesn't. And then our jump diffusion is asymptotic at high Q. Um, so these are all plotted for the same uh, for the same time constant or tau. So yeah. So we can think of, we have the, the energy change in half width, half max, which we have as gamma measured in microelectron volts. Um, this is a neutron thing. We generally get our energy changes in electron volts. Um, now, as I say, the energy is also uh, related to the speed, inversely related to the speed. And so we have, or we can extract a characteristic jump time or a characteristic time in the sense of a confined model um, that lets us know how fast things are moving. Yeah. The time taken between jumps, essentially. Um, I haven't really got time to get into it. But at low Q, every, all of the non-range models approximate a straight line. At high Q, um, they all asymptotically approach a specific time constant, which tells you about the, uh, the rate of jumping, the time it, uh, at the particle sits statically before jumping to another position. So Fickian diffusion breaks down on the atomic scale because of solvation effects in liquids at least where you have a solvation cell which prevents the um the atom from moving to another position because your solvation shell is in the way at some point due to random motion the solvation sphere will uh change and that will allow the particle to jump to a new position. So, yes, uh, we know how fast something is going. We know how far it's going. Um, yeah, Fickian diffusion only works on the macroscopic scale because of solvation cells and other things. Uh, but Fickian diffusion is generally what is it for, referred to as diffusion. Okay, so if we have a, a confined motion, which has constant gamma, constant broadening across Q, then 
another method to determine the geometry of it of its motion is what we call the elastic incoherent structure factor which is a bit of a mouthful so everyone just calls it eisf and this can give an idea of the geometry uh, in confined motion and what we look at is the intensity of the elastic incoherent scattering over the intensity of, over the intensity of the total incoherent scattering um, and we can see how that varies in q and get a lovely graph out like this essentially when you have something which is confined your neutrons will have or well, the scattering will have a an elastic portion and an inelastic portion and we see how that varies with Q. So at zero Q, by definition, all scattering must be elastic. Um, and so we always start off at one and then we decrease in value. Uh, so the fraction of inelastic scattering increases with Q. And the way in which it does so uh, can give you information about how these things are moving. So some models plotted there, it's not an exhaustive list, are uh, two site jump. So an atom jumping between two different places on the lattice, a three site jump, you can imagine a methyl group within a potential well. Uh, you can have diffusion confined within a sphere. This is uh, quite often representative of what's going on within pores. And then we can have isotropic rotation, which is essentially the whole uh, molecule tumbling around. Okay, so that's a very brief talk about neutron theory and Quen's theory. Um, I'm not expecting you to understand it by any means, but hopefully it gives you a, a basic understanding of what we can measure, which is diffusion, and how we do it is by looking at scattering at a range of angles and with a range of energies. So what do we want if you want to come and do a measurement? So we normally put these things in our aluminium cans. Aluminium is pretty transparent to neutrons. Um, this is an example of a three-piece can. We have the outer, we have an inner, and we have a lid. This is a drawing of the assembled can, and we have a, an annular space, basically a hollow cylinder space, uh, which is defined by the distance between the inner and the outer of the can. Uh, we can vary that space to adjust how, well, to just how much material is in the beam. The amount of material we want in the beam is one that scatters 10% of the neutrons. Uh, and this we can calculate from the composition of your sample and the neutron scattering cross sections that I showed you earlier. Um, if you have more than one scattering event when a neutron is detected, you can't tell where the energy transfer occurred. Um, so you lose your information. If you have a 10% scatterer, then essentially 90 odd percent of 99%, I think, of the neutrons that you detect. Um, I've only undergone one scattering event. Um, yeah, we have to avoid strong absorbers. So typical ones are lithium. Um, can't remember which way around it is. So the lithium six or lithium seven is horrible, but the other isotope is okay. So you can do measurements on iron conductors with lithium if you have it isotopically enriched. Um, you can also have it without isotopically enriched, but it's a lot harder. Um, those are other standard materials that strongly absorb and instantly used in neutron shielding. So the bread and butter of what I've done and what the hub has done so far is looking at sub half grams organic samples absorbed within um, a zeolite framework. And I guess organic sorbates is probably 
overstating that because there's also been a fair amount done with ammonia. Uh, as I said earlier, other measurements are possible if you want to look at biological systems, so biocatalysis, and we can do other things beyond this, but this is um, aimed at catalysis and where we are at the moment. If you have any fabulous ideas, speak to me and I'll try to get it done. Okay, so beam time itself is very precious because neutrons are hard to make. Uh, I showed you how we have a massive proton synchrotron and linear accelerators and all of that. Uh, it's a lot more fancy than diamond, which you're probably fairly familiar with, because we use protons, which are much heavier than electrons, harder to accelerate. We use up all of our protons, so the protons are fired into the target 50 times a second. In diamond, they just stick their electrons into a big storage ring, and they go round and round and round, and they top them up every 10 minutes or so. Um, so with ISIS, it's much more energy intense. And we have around a 10 million pound electricity bill in a year for doing this. Um, flux limits measurement rapidity. We are a flux limited technique. It's relatively easy to make lots of X-rays, um, but neutrons um, much trickier. Uh, if you were to get all the neutrons we've ever made in the 40 years of operation, it would fill just about a teaspoon. So we run 24-7, as long as the beam behaves, um, which means that sample changes may be inconvenient. We run five cycles a year, generally, uh, of... Uh, month to two month length and the bag which has been awarded to the hub has been awarded 18 days over three years and the way we're thinking of doing that is sort of two or three days twice a year um we haven't done this before so this is flexible if things go well or badly um and i'm sure it will go well so but we are flexible so the conditions that we will be offering uh, are sealed samples. Um, and sealed samples with adsorbents, if you heat them up, uh, can generate enough pressure to blow our cans apart and explode things. If you explode things in the beam, you get radioactive powders all over the place and you ruin people's days. Um, so we want to avoid that. So think about uh, desorption upon heating if you're wanting to go hot. We can run from 10 to 500K approximately, although we would much prefer that to be 10 to 373K. Uh, this is because of seals. We can use uh, polymer seals up to 500K. They are not as reliable and if they get cold, they can get brittle and snap. Uh, we use indium seals up to 373K. Above that, it will melt, but below that, it's much more uh, robust. Now, at ISIS itself, we can do much more extreme measurements. Uh, so millikelvin up to thousands of Kelvin. Uh, ultra high vacuum up to gigapascals of pressure. Um, we can do flow through gas environments. We can do all sorts of things. Uh, but if you want to do th those kind of things, they will not be done through the bag. They will have to be a separate application, which will go through the full approval process at Diamond. What we can do possibly is that we can do uh, a brief measurement with your sample to show that it is interesting and it scatters sufficiently strongly, and then that can then go on to a great proposal. Uh, so I'll speed up a bit because I'm nearly out of time. The process we'll have is that you should check your experiment suitability, firstly by talking to 
someone you know who knows about Quens, or if you don't know anyone who knows about Quens, then I am the contact. Please get in contact with me. I love talking about Quens. Uh, you'll then fill in the form, which is available on the uh, Catalysis Hub website. There will be, like I say, initially two calls a year, and we'll see how we do with that. If your beam time is successful, you will come to ISIS. You will measure it. You're expected to be here for all the time that measurement is going on, but we can provide uh, accommodation, subsistence, travel. Uh, once you've done your measurement, we want a report. The report doesn't need to be long. If it's we tried to measure it and uh, the sample didn't scatter strongly enough, that's sufficient, but we do need to keep track of what we're doing. And then we ask you to publish and acknowledge the hub and ISIS for their time. Uh, this is a, a condition of ISIS beam time. Uh, you get a, an embargo for three years after that time. All the data is freely available unless you pay a lot of money for it not to be freely available. Um, but generally, it all becomes freely available for academic people, but sometimes businesses like to keep it sealed. Okay, so to summarize, hydrogen's the best incoherent scatterer. 99.5% of what we do is looking at hydrogen. You can do selective tutoration in some circumstances to decrease a signal that you're not interested in. Uh, we can measure the kinetics of things moving. We can measure the geometry of things moving. Uh, if we can measure that as a function of temperature and we can get out uh, activation energies of diffusion. And we will be here to support you by we, I mean me and the rest of ISIS and the hub. Uh, any questions, anytime, get in contact. We will help you with preparation of your case. We will help you with measuring and we will help you with data interpretation as well. And then here you can see some very, very happy people who've been doing neutron scattering because neutron scattering is fun. It's unfortunate that it happened uh, during COVID, but behind those masks and massive grins, they're having the best time. And that's it for me as far as the presentation goes, so I'm happy to have any discussion, any questions from you. So if you have any questions for Ian, please type them in the, the Q&A. Um, I will say if you have done uh, synchrotron beam times, neutron beam times tend to be a little more relaxed. Um, yes, and actually one thing I will emphasise as well is that I said we're here to help. Part of this initiative is to get new people using neutrons. So there will be a preference given to people who have never used neutrons before uh, in the assessment. So please get in touch if you never use neutrons. We don't want this to be a closed shop for people who already know what they're doing. I was just going to ask a question about the bag, because obviously we've been running the uh, synchrotron bag for a while and we know sort of how many samples we can kind of fit into those two or three days that we have in any cycle. With a, a neutron measurement, are we looking at one or two samples per group or how, how time yes. intensive of it? Yes. So I did have it on a slide, although I didn't pull it out. Uh, for an, an elastic window measurement, that would be about two to four hours for a complete, inel complete elastic window experiment. So we would normally run from, say, 10 to 300K in 10 Kelvin steps, or 15 or 20 or whatever. Um, and for a single data point where you need to undertake full quens fitting, that would normally take around the same amount of time as a single uh, uh, elastic window measurement. So we would normally say about 
four hours, three or four hours for that. Um, so depending on how the applications go, if we predominantly have requests for elastic windows, then we should be able to get through, uh, well, four a day, something like that. However, if people want to measure something in more detail, then we may only get one sample per day, which would be running one sample for the full coin fitting at a number of temperatures to get your activation energy out. Okay. So someone, um, an anonymous attendee has asked, says, sorry, they're not super familiar with quens, but they've read that phase transitions can be looked at. Is this easy to do? Yes, absolutely. Phase transitions are very easy to see. Well, first order phase transitions are very easy to see. So if you remember that uh, slide I showed with Alex's um, system, where the elastic peak, the elastic window scan, the peak, the intensity came down and went up again. The going up again is the indication there is a phase transition occurring from a mobile phase to a static phase. If you wanted to look at a melting point or another transition, then it's very easy. Looking at glasses and polymers and other things that undergo uh, glass transitions, these can be a bit more complicated to see because the nature of them is a bit more subtle. But yes, it's something that we absolutely look at. Okay. So Pablo asks, when you mentioned lithium, is it possible to see diffusion of hydrogen in a liquid metal, e.g. to enrich lithium? Ooh. This would presumably be possible, but absolutely not something you would do through the bag. Um, so that will be for submitting a promo proposal to ISIS? Yes, a full proposal to ISIS. Um, so I mentioned more extreme environments we have. Um, so we have measured liquid metals in the past. Um, but obviously that's pretty high. Well, for lots of metals, this is pretty high temperature. And we would generally do these extreme conditions one at a time. So we may not be able to have hydrogen at the same time as high pressure, for example. Um, so it might depend on exactly the experimental setup that you would need. Uh, but having said that, we're always interested in building new stuff, although it can take time. But we're very happy to take your um, sample environment if it's going to have gas and it needs to be uh, tested for pressure to make sure it's safe and if it's electric we need to have uh, the electric stuff pat tested um, and sample environment that you have yourself is probably not um, well suited just to chuck in the beam line like it would be with x-rays so we need larger samples than most other techniques, like I said, we would be operating on gram scale rather than microgram scale. So, I, so I'd probably suggest them that if Pablo was interested in doing the experiment, he got in touch and had a chat with you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and that could be explored. Um, so Luke has asked. Um, you mentioned that some researchers investigate ammonia diffusion. Is this something we can do with Bag, or should we submit a sub separate proposal to ISIS? So, as I've said, we would like to have sealed samples. And by that, I mean that you seal the sample up and you give it to us, and then we measure it. Now, we can either do that with you present at ISIS, or we can send you the sample cans so that you can load them yourself at your home institution. Uh, but we do not want to be doing, in the bag at least, gas handling on the beam line. So if you can load your sample up with ammonia and then in a glove box or whatever, transfer it to the sample can, then yes, this is something we can do. If you want to measure a background with an empty framework and then dose with ammonia, 
this is something we do all the time, but it's not within the remit of the bag. That would be an in situ experiment that would have to go through a full ISIS proposal. Having said that, the ISIS proposals are two times a year, generally six, well, generally October and April, six months apart. And we are very happy to get new uh, proposals, new techniques, new users. And again, speak to me if you're interested. Uh, but it, this kind of measurement is beyond what we do with the bag. If there's any more questions, type now or, well, not for a hold your piece, speak to Ian, uh, Ian separately. Um, I've, I've got a thought. If someone's never used neutrons and wants to give a bag a go, is the information on ISIS about calculating the sort of the scattering and the sample suitability, or is there somewhere like somewhere they can go? Uh, so there's an awful lot on the ISIS website. Okay. Um, there are user pages which will give you a rough idea of what the normal application process is. With the bag, it's going to be a bit more light touch um, in terms of which proposals get beam time. Um, there is a great book by Mark Telling called Practical Guide to Quasi-Elastic Neutron Scattering. Um, there are lots of other resources. Please get in touch with me if you need some. I think there may be some links from the Quen's bag page as well. Uh, but if not, we can add them. Yep. OK, oh, we've had one more question come in. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a question that's easy to answer. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ian. Um, if you know of anyone who's missed this, we will be putting it up on our YouTube channel so everyone can find out more about um, Quenz and the uh, bag process. Um, the call is now open. I've put the link to the, the Cat Hub webpage um, in the chat, but if you go to the UK, catalysishub.co.uk and search for bag, it will come up. There is a, a form on there. It's only sort of a two page form, so it, it's quite light. And the call will close, I think, on the 6th of December. Um, but it says it on the web page. Um, and yes. yeah, any questions, we're really interested in hearing from you. Um, and if you're interested in 